thank you everybody for coming for the talk. Uh, I think there might be a requirement for speakers to put a real square on at least one of our slides now. I think you have at least the best picture from the oh. How to find, but yeah, I think it's the square, I guess you know what, what it represents, and this spaghetti, in fact, represents time series, so that's kind of what we are trying to do today, it's mix the two together. Um, okay. Um, yeah, a more real use case of time series is, um, I don't know, do you know what kind of data is that? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, cardiograms. Uh, yeah, so it's one example of what, what time series is. Uh, you have different kind of sensors when they plug you. I'm not an expert, so I might. And then I know they are checking probably when, when the left ventricle open or stuff like that. And I know they have like, I don't know, like 10 different time series. And yeah, my doctor is looking at it and trying to find if you have a problem or something. So in fact, the doctor is doing like kind of pattern matching on the time series because he's looking at the time series and he's, he knows what he's looking for. So you have kind of input for him. He's like, okay, I'm looking for these kind of things. So you probably have at least, I don't know, like 10, 20, I don't know, 50 kind of pattern, he knows that has problems and he knows given problems, so he will look on these different charts, time series, and try to find the pattern and say, okay, oh, this guy is okay, I cannot find anything suspicious here, or oh, he's not okay, and yeah, well, well then you need to do the further diagnostics and, and so on. So this is a kind of um, problem that we can like, um, address with uh, doing like pattern, pattern search and, and diameter wrapping is just a, a better way to do it to, to, to find uh, kind of matching that are not perfect, but a bit different. So uh, I will explain all this. Uh, yeah, so that's the context of the talk today and how to, to try to do it, uh, if we need a greater scale, how to do it using Flink. Uh, yeah, so my, my name is Christa Selperic. So I am uh, started to work like 10 days ago in Akama in, in, in Krakow. Uh, so this was done a bit before. Um, so yeah, just a few words about Akamai, maybe a few of, of you know what they are doing. I didn't know that much before. Um, yeah, it's, it's a leader on what we call CDN, so it's like serving uh, content on internet. Uh, so there are different sizes, so may maybe uh, one picture is a bit easier to explain. So uh, basically you have some servers, some content on some servers, uh, and then you have uh, the whole internet on the globe, and, and you have the end user on the right. Uh, so it's trying to find the best way and more efficient way to move uh, data from the data centers anywhere in the world to close to the user. So like if you have video streaming and stuff like that, it's very important to have good, good quality. So yeah, we're working on HTTP, HTTPS, DNS. We have like a few thousands of servers in many cities and so on, and lots of data, as you can see, like terabytes. Uh, yeah, so me, I will be working on DNS data. Uh, also recruiting a data engineer and data science team. So, and some security people. If you know some security people, I'm very interested to hear about it. It's, it seems to be hard to get those guys. Uh, yeah, so if you know some kind of malware, botnet hackers, I would be pleased to speak with them <laughs> to help us to make the internet safer. Uh, a few words about me too. Um, yeah, so I've been in the kind of IT world like for over 15 years. Uh, a bit more recently, or not that recently, like 2013, I've started to work a bit with Hadoop. When it was still MapReduce, a bit, bit painful. People who didn't know that, you know, it's better to have Flink or Spark. Uh, I pretty much work a lot with time series and machine learning. So time series, I was also using HBase to store like uh, uh, the wall um, in France, so I was working in EDF, and they have these nuclear plants. So in fact, you have the wall 30 years history, so we had to store like thousands, billions of points of time series there. So we are using HBase, so I was working on that. 
Uh, also working on Spark, also on time series to do some categorization, try to find some profile of customers. So modi modifying the MLLib algorithm in in, in, uh, in Spark to do that. And yeah, more also then I wanted to do more machine learning, so I did a PhD on stream mining. So that's also why I like Flink because also yeah, still it streams. Uh, so I was working from like people know maybe Weka. It's, like the Java equivalent of scikit-learn or so like, and there is a small library called MOA, which is dedicated for uh, doing machine learning on streaming data. So if we have a bit of time, I will maybe just say a few words. I was also uh, doing some example in, in Flink in my GitHub. So if we have a bit of time at the end, I will be happy to maybe just say a few words. If some of you are interested, I will be more than happy to speak about it a bit later. Uh, so back to our topic, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so today will be uh, about Flink. Uh, uh, yeah, that's more details if you want to check some presentations. Yeah, but yeah, I like to play tennis, I like to do some boats. And you also have timestamp on boats, by the way. You see the number there, in fact, it's, it's time you buy a new boat to give you a new number. So it's timestamp from like 65, so rather old. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the agenda for today. Uh, so first we'll be present what is a time series and some example of time series. Uh, then explain how do you want to compare them so that we have a distance measure so that when we do a, we try to find some pattern, we need to compare time series we are scanning with the pattern we are looking. So we'll explain what kind of distance we, we can use and what, what, what is great. Uh, then before, doing some implementation, let's look at what already exists in the literature. So like bibliography on fast one core implementation and some also on parallelized one. Uh, one use case to see kind of some results we can get, some benchmark to have some numbers how performant it is, and then uh, some conclusion on yeah, tons of future work that could be done. Uh, yeah, so time series maybe uh, first one that you can think of, maybe it's also a, a market stock. Uh, there you have, uh, like every second, you have people buying, so you have a price, you have a volume. Uh, if you do it per day, then you have the open price, the closed price, uh, and so on, the volume of the day. Uh, so typically, it can be one, one use case if you want to try to find some things that already happened. If you have something you are looking for in this time series, you could do it on this kind of data. Uh, back to our uh, health uh, data. So yes, yes, it's some example to show that, um, like, if the doctor, uh, if, if we want to check for these kind of problems, uh, if you go there, probably like V2 and V3 are the two ones that you look are really different from the normal ones. Uh, so if you are really looking, you can okay. If you are looking for this kind of of pattern for V2, you probably find that you have a problem there. So this could really help doctors to to spot. Uh, uh, more on, especially that this, I think the frequency is like between like around 1,000 hertz on those data. So even if you are plugged for 10 minutes, usually the doctor is just taking like a few, like uh, not even one second of data. So if you have something that's scaled and it's nice, you can probably uh, check much more data than what the doctor could do. So uh, then I'll just show him and say, oh, maybe you should look at this particular time that it was strange and not just the one he picked by kind of by chance. I guess I'm, what I've heard, I'm not, uh, maybe they are doing differently, but uh, what, uh, what I heard. Uh, another problem, yeah, I was working in the industry, uh, another problem that uh, you could also, it's, uh, uh, here it's uh, pipes, and you can see that it's completely destroyed here. And uh, in fact, when you have pipes, there is some phenomenon called the water hammer. Uh, it's in fact, when you, I think it's, I guess it's the same like in the house, in some old houses. When you open the, uh, the valve, sometimes it makes a lot of noise. And uh, in fact, it's a known problem that, uh, in fact, when you open the valve, when you open, you have a lot of pressure going and you have some kind of uh, oscillation. And the oscillation can go pretty strong. And then if it's uh, the way you open it can destroy the pipes. Uh, so like power plants, in fact, it's just a lot of pipes. So like in EDF, we, have this, uh, we are looking at some, some pattern like that to try to find uh, depending on how you open the valve, what kind of, uh, although there way, how you should open the valve to avoid to have this kind of, uh, of things. So that's more industrial use case. Uh, yeah, from 
tiny bit more, uh, yeah, some other examples. So yes, I mean, I think the full, we are not missing use cases here to, 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 to do our, our things. So like all the IoT, IoT data usually are, can be as time series, sales marketing data as well. Um, all your monitoring data also can be seen as, as time series. Uh, on the sales machine, we see the uh, ECG, but you also EEG, earthquakes. Uh, DNA wouldn't look like a time series at first glance, but in fact, um, we don't really care about the time. It just needs to be a sequence that is ordered, so um, DNA can be considered also as a, a use case here. Um, yeah, social network. Uh, we had also the presentation of Uber when they were having this accelerator, so it would be also one, one use case here. You could use this kind of data. would work perfectly to try to find when there is a big acceleration. And then a stop, so you could say, okay, I want to find this kind of patterns. One big spike, then flat because the car had stopped, so it would be a very good use case. Yeah, um, yeah so check Wikipedia, just a series of points indexed in time order. So in Flink World, it's rather simple. It's just the upper three of, you have an ID of the sensors of the series, a timestamp and a value one. You just need that, so really lightweight, so it's great to have good performances. Uh, so yeah, time series is, uh, like in the data science, data scientists work, usually like you consider like 80% of the work is like data cleaning. I think if you work with time series, it's probably even worse because it's really a lot of things that could happen. Uh, you have some, you can have some outliers. Uh, you can have some periods where, I don't know, your sensor was uh, uh, not working or the network was low quality, so data were not sent. So you need then to find the way to fill gaps. Either you discard the whole, uh, uh, the whole service that uh, was invaded, either you try to fill gaps with different methods. Uh, you also have seasonality, like for sales, you have if in Europe, for example, if you arrive before Christmas, you have a big peak. Maybe customers are still the same, but if you look at the, at the time story, it really looks like it's going up, but maybe the pattern is the same inside, so you have to remove it. Uh, sometimes you don't need that much data, like for the electrocardiogram, you can probably sometimes just subsample the data, so then it's faster. Between industry, sometimes and in starting the Fourier transform to transform from uh, the energy uh, of the time series. Anyway, a ton of stuff, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I will not speak about that. It's all pre-processing you could do before using the dynamic tarping algorithm later, but yeah, keep in mind that you cannot usually, you cannot plug it straight away like that in, in the time series. Uh, yeah, then in time series you have different kind of, uh, um, of mach um, data mining you can do. Uh, maybe the most known is like anomaly detection when you try to find something is different. Uh, yeah, let's spend too much time that. Um, so now, yeah, we'll speak more about really what we're trying to do here with the time series and, and Flink. Uh, so uh, the use case we do in data mining here, it's a pattern search. So we have a, pat a known pattern in, in advance. I mean, it could be one pattern, it could be like, I don't know, 100 patterns. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you have to do 100 times the search, but uh, then we can use Flink for just parallelize on the pattern, for, for example. Uh, and then you have a time series. So basically what happened is you try to take this pattern, you put it on the time series and you move with the time. Uh, either on past data, you can replace the past data, and if you are on live streaming data, you can do it on streaming data. Uh, and then you try to find the best match. So usually the first data you see will be the best match because you didn't see anything before. So if you are trying to find the best match, the first at the beginning, you have lots of matches because you didn't see that many different things, so you say, okay, anyway, my distance is pretty big, but still it's a match because I have nothing better than this one. So it's important, I mean, more like for performance later to, to, to understand that uh, you have much more matches at the beginning because you didn't see that many data, so you don't really know how your data look like. And then later on, because you already find like best matches, so you can say, okay, if I have things really different before, I don't really have to scan them to, I just try to find the one which has, seems to be closest, and then you can do great optimization. So that's why I a bit insist here, because then it's, uh, the algorithm later will be fast because of this, because it's, the stream can be long, and you, can, you, you know what you are looking for, so you can discard a lot of computations. Um, 
So if you have to do a pattern search, uh, kind of you know the easy way, and if you have like just few hours, you probably what you will do is you will take the pattern, the time series. So here, uh, I don't know which one is. It doesn't matter. I mean, that says in in red is uh, it is uh, the pattern, or the, we call it the query that you are searching for, and in blue, uh, it's a time series. So you can just uh, compute the distance between the two and do the sum of the distance, and yeah, it gives you a, a distance. And you continue, and uh, you move a bit the data, you redo it, uh, and so on, and then you try to find find the best one. Uh, but here, you, the distance will be rather big. But even if you if you look at the data, they really look very similar because they are tiny bit disaligned here and here. So in fact, if you could you know, try to compress at some part and extend at some other part, you would probably manage to put the peaks together and the distance would be much, much smaller. So that's why they call the dynamic time wrapping, because they are doing this. They are, in fact, not comparing uh, timestamp aligned per timestamp, but they are, uh, can try to disalign a bit, either compressing or expanding uh, the, the pattern so that it's try to find a be better match. So it's, I don't know, like maybe 20, 30 year old algorithms, there's nothing new here. But usually it's considered in the literature as kind of the best way to find, do, uh, uh, to find a, a pattern in a time series. It's kind of considered as a, one of the best way to, to do it. Uh, the problem is that the algorithm is, um, so you have this uh, distortion, so it's called the R parameter. How much you, you allow to disalign uh, the time series. To, to do the comparison. Uh, yeah, so C is a time series that is streaming, Q is a query or uh, the, um, the, what you are looking for. And the algorithm is like you are um, trying, you can move from R steps between aligning, so you are trying different uh, ways. So here you are probably shrinking the time. At the end, you are expanding the time. Uh, so if you look at this, we are like, okay, but now my complexity that was looking like just linear be before because I was just comparing point to point. Now you have like a two-dimensional uh, 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 table, so it's more likely to be you know quadratic now. So it will scale much much uh, much much less. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that's kind of distance on what we are trying to do because we want to have a good algorithm that can find uh, the pattern we we want. So. So yeah, if you look in the literature, you have uh, one very nice paper for two from 2012. It was even the best uh, KDD paper this year, uh, which is yeah, it's it's kind of strange paper for KDD because it's an engineering paper. It's not really a research paper, and um, and what's pretty nice here is they don't propose really a new method, but they're just taking like four or five methods from other paper and put them together and say, okay, but, uh, you know, people are complaining, like, people are taking some quote, like, you know, that uh, some people are doing gesture recognition and it took over two hours to, to run their algorithm and check things, and with their implementation, it takes less than three seconds. So, in fact, they say, why trying to find some other techniques if we can just make this one faster, because people say it's kind of the best way to do the comparison. So, they, they propose this uh, library, and they also open source the code. Uh, so it's it's a very uh, standalone like C C code, no imports. So really nice to 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 port to Java. So I just port this one to Java. In fact, la later on, um, well, I was a bit more lazy because I mean they implement the DQ, but I reuse the DQ from the Java library. Uh, but yeah, there are really you know it's really no dependencies, so it's pretty. You can probably port it in any language pretty pretty easily. And here you can see the performances. So it's both here at the time it takes, uh, the query length, because query length is kind of a strong factor of computation time. And you can see you have many orders of magnitude between the na na naive implementation and their implementation, which is in, in green. So, so that it's what we'll try to, to reuse in, in here. Um, So why is it so fast? In fact, it's because they managed to compute what they called a, a lower bound. So in fact, once you've started to find some patterns, uh, you you kind of know uh, how your pattern looks like. So you, you can say, OK, if I start to compute uh, the distance, if 
you can have some threshold like they call the up, upper bound in U. That if it's, uh, if I do the without going through the whole uh, you know the whole matrix of possible paths, you can just use uh, like the Euclidean distance or the direct one. And if this one is already bigger than the best thing I found, I can just stop computing. It will give you like I don't know the best distance was like three between the time series and the, the pattern. And, and then it will tell you, okay, how is this? I, I can I can say without computing everything that anyway the best I will do will be four. Maybe it will be like five or six, but you can already say that I, anyway there is no way I can do better than four. So you can stop computing because it will not be better than what you already have found. So there was a lot of this kind of techniques they were using, and in fact it was just screenshot from from the their publication. So here you have uh, the um, complexity of the algorithm. And here you have what they call the tightness of the lower bound. So it's how, how the, um, like what the computation area will be close to the real value. So the perfect one is one, and it's a full calculation of the diameter wrapping, which is uh, in complexity O and R. And you have some, some of them which are almost o, O1. So in fact, you can usually like 80 or 90% of the computation can be removed by this one. Then this one will almost uh, remove all the computation, and you will compute very, very few full uh, dynamic tar tar warping using, using these techniques. So it's pretty nice. They didn't take all these slower bones, they just take three or four of them. They take this one here because it's obvious, and they took one, uh, one here, and then uh, I think one here, and then the full one. And you can see that it takes best of both worlds. Uh, so. uh, Yes, yeah, so some related work. So you have some reuse of this paper in Spark. Uh, already you have some uh, publication. Uh, one new port, in fact, the code in Java. Um, it's really f fairly simple to, or maybe in Scala in the case of Spark. Uh, I was doing it also on, on Spark, so it's, I think Scala might be better because then it's a bit complicated to, to, to move. Uh, and also one that I, Kind of so after uh, putting this this presentation because there already is one on Flink, uh, but the goal there it's more like to uh, focus on fast detection to so very small windows, and but yes, they have a, a publication and those guys are also in Berlin. So I don't know are they in the room? No, they didn't come to the conference. I tried to contact them but uh, didn't get feedback. So anyway, you can have a look at the paper and then you will have some ideas. Of implementation, but still they are reusing the paper I presented before. So uh, coming from them, they just do some slight, slightly different uh, modifications. Uh, so one use case. Um, yeah, as I said, I was working in a utilities company, EDF. So we had data coming from the grid. Uh, was the frequency? So frequencies uh, we have 50 hertz in Europe, and you can put some measurement in any plug in the whole Europe and you will have the same measurement. Uh, should be around 50 hertz. And in fact, um, usually when you are losing some power plants or stuff like that, uh, in fact, the frequency drops. And then you need to have some, you need, I don't know, like if you have some, you need to open some dump to have some water flowing so that it put uh, power back in, inside the, the grid. Um, you can have some um, plants that have some uh, reserve of power and they will have to, and in fact, there is a regulation, and in fact, uh, all actors that can put, put power on the grid, they have to react. If they see this kind of pattern, they're obliged to, or they can contract to put, to put it back, and if they don't do it, they have some fines. So it's pretty important for them to, to be able to detect this so that they can send power on the grid so that the frequency is not, doesn't drop too much. Uh, so yeah, that's the use case I will present here. Uh, what's good about it, it's open data. You can get it there, you have other places. On this one, at least you have a one hertz. So it gives you like for five years, 166 million of points. Not that big, but uh, still decent for first test. Uh, yeah, maybe one. Uh, when it's, uh, it was in CSV. So in fact, I converted to, to, to Avro. And in fact, yeah, I think it's, most of you know, but yeah, it's really important to pay attention of the way you are storing your data, especially if you have fast processing after, because it might be the bottleneck. Uh, and in, in that case, it's almost a bottleneck, because uh, when I was doing the search on those data, uh, from pattern size from one second to five seconds, it took less than one minute. So the, the main time was uh, to, to read the data. So it gives me a search speed of three million points per second. So let's 
I think it's, it's pretty nice to handle uh, many use cases. So in that case, in fact, I was using Flink, not streaming, but Flink uh, batch to do this because it's past data, so it's uh, probably a bit better to use Flink, Flink batch there than try to, re try to regenerate the, the stream. Uh, and one reason, I was using like 1% possible wrapping on it, and that's the pattern I'm looking for. I was a bit lazy, so you, I could have do something a bit smoother, but I just create this, this pattern. Um, yeah, after one minute, I, get, I asked for having the 10 best matches, and it returned me this, and at those dates, there was this kind of, uh, of drops. Uh, and the algorithm was for scaling, so that's why we don't have exactly, I mean, we, we have different levels, because it's, it's uh, the normalization on the data. And if you put 10%, you can really see that sometimes it's much before, sometimes at after, and so on, so you, the kind of things you can, you can find. So then you can ask uh, an expert to look at those data and try to understand what's going on on those different dates and see if it's normal, abnormal, and, and so on. Uh, yeah, so I said it's very fast because of the pruning, so I got some statistics about the pruning for one of those calculations. So in fact, uh, this one was managed to use it like 95% of the time, although in time we used the one which was uh, there. And in fact, we just have to do like, uh, well, I don't even know how to say it, like, uh, 8, uh, 0.008% of calculation that we are done the full dynamic time wrapping one. So that shows that, you know, this pruning really works well. Uh, so in fact, when you are using uh, that in Flink, you have to take care of, uh, I didn't do the, I didn't implement this, but uh, you have to take care because in fact, when you are in the, you know, in, uh, in kind of non-string world, uh, like in the case you are using Flink batch, yeah, you consider that all data, there is no order in the data. You can either start with the, uh, the latest data or the most recent, uh, the, and the oldest data. And you know, the kind of big data parting is that you can process all, you, like the map, the map doesn't care about the order of the data. So in fact, what happened is here, if we, when you change of uh, partition, I mean, you already have no control of partition. Imagine you have four years of data, each year is one partition. Flink might start to read uh, data from 2018 and then 2015 and then 2017 and so on. So in fact, when you change of partition, uh, you move from uh, the year, for example, 2018, 2016, uh, during this, this shift, the algorithm will consider this continuation of data. So you will have to, uh, in fact, you have to, to stop uh, the code and say, okay, this is a change, it's a new partition, you need to restart the search and not consider that it's, uh, uh, continuous data, so you have to take care of this. And then if you do that, still you will lose some because you, you will have uh, to try to find the end data of 2016 to put it with the beginning of 2017 because there could be a match just in the change of year. So you could miss this match. So in fact, you, you also have to take care of that. So uh, as it's very small data, maybe one way, one simple way to do it is like you, you just, when you put your result, you, in the change, you can detect the change of partition uh, pretty easily because you can compare the timestamp between two and just, okay, just send uh, the data from the uh, previous partition, the last points, uh, and then the first one of the next one, and then have some extra work uh, either on the master or just, just because it will be just few data points compared to the millions we have, so it will be very easy to, to compute. So that's one way to, to fix that. But yeah, out of the box, you, you have to take care of this. Now we'll also did an implementation in, in streaming. Uh, I didn't have that much time to try to do them on a real cluster. Uh, but still, I, I mean, thanks to, there is a flink uh, for Kubernetes. I thought, okay, but those stuff doesn't work out of the box usually, and then you have to, it's, it's pain to use, but well, I guess in one hour I managed to have some job running in, in, in Kubernetes, and I joined the company 10 days ago, and I managed to have an Azure access on some resource group, and I could spin up like uh, a cluster so I could do some first test. Not fully happy, we have, I will have to do more, but still it will give you some first insight. So I just ran off my laptop, 
uh, just put one thread to be sure that, well, when you start to put too many threads, you don't know what happens, so you don't know what you measure, and I don't really like it. Uh, so I was doing here to a bit easier to have more data, a streaming data generator. Uh, it's also kind of standard in the literature to use what they call random work. So in fact, you have it go up, down, slowly, and so on. So you have some. It's random, but you know it's really look like a time series. Um, what is now the generator? I can have like 20 million uh, record seconds if I use it standalone, and I want to put it in Flink. Uh, I still have, I mean, Flink streaming. I still have between two or three million of points per second per, per thread. So uh, pretty nice, given the algorithm will almost manage to catch up with that. Uh, yeah. So when I, I run it, so I tried on two kind of uh, jumping windows. Uh, so one of 10,000 points and the other one of one million points. Uh, so uh, I try for different pattern size and different uh, time wrapping uh, compression expansion uh, with parameter like 20%. Uh, in blue, so it's most expensive and so on. So on this 10,000 points, we take like uh, just uh, kind of, if we take 10%, around 20 milliseconds to find the best pattern. And if I move to 1 million, uh, yeah, it's still 100, 100 times more data, but it still takes just uh, over 300 uh, milliseconds. Uh, because what I explained before, because the more data you have, then you can find a bond which is smaller, so it's, you can discard calculation more if you have longer time, time series. Um, so yeah, it's exactly what I explained. Like I, I just take the two different windows and uh, just shows uh, box plot, but how many um, uh, early dropping, how many com computation I can miss, and you can see when you have uh, more data, you have much less uh, calculations. Um, yeah, this one was the same, but just to see with uh, pattern uh, or with thousand points. So yeah, might be. Uh, so the issues with um, uh, with the uh, flink streaming. Uh, well, I was using jumping windows. So jumping windows, in fact, we have the same problem as we had before with partition, because just when you jump, you are this point of jumping where you are. You should keep the data from the last latest data from the previous window and so on. So in Flink, Flink usually it's, you know, it's fairly easy to to fix. You just use sliding windows to do that. Uh, yeah, I was uh, speaking with uh, Nico uh, on the break and. And it, in fact, it was very, very slow uh, because, in fact, uh, sliding windows are optimized like for small sliding at the beginning. And in my case, what I was sliding, I was when if I have a window of 10,000 and a pattern of 100, I was sliding almost the whole window and just uh, a tiny bit were in common. And since the implementation is optimized like for sliding, a, you know, just a bit the windows, which is probably the main use case. But in my case, I was kind of, but yeah, uh, normally if you re-implement a process function, you can fix that and have almost the same performances. Uh, yes, so the, now the test on Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, I was a bit lazy, so I do mainly screenshots. Uh, so the Azure interface, so I was using six uh, machines, uh, eight CPUs, 56 memory of RAM, and then I was using 40 Task manager, I could have put like probably 40, 46 and keep some for the job manager, but and uh, four gigabyte per task manager. Uh, so, in fact, uh, that's the execution plan, but you know, fairly easy. You take a source. So, the source generate, uh, you can specify the number of sensors you want, uh, and, and then generate timestamp and then the, uh, the value of the uh, time series. And then you just have the, the window, so you just key by, so it shuffles a lot of data, send it for each uh, task manager which is doing the search. Uh, so I tried between like 1 million points to 4 billion points. Um, so in that case, in fact, I was, I remember I have 40 task, task managers, so in fact it's written 40 because you have like, uh, or at least for the 30 case, you have 30 in the source and 30 then, so that's why it shows 60, but I was managed to just use one tax manager for all. So you can see that it's, uh, in that case, uh, 
we manage to keep the performance because we can have one worker per time per, per sensor. So we manage to, uh, to to have good performances. Yeah, don't have that much time maybe to go into details, but it seems to work well. I try to do more, and then I think it's where well, you need to do some tuning because it was starting to crash. So, uh, when you put much more and, and so on, you probably need to think uh, uh, a bit more through how you do it. Uh, because you know, as we can see, it's very CPU intensive and also very network intensive, which is because the algorithm is fast, so it's getting, generating data and throwing the, through the, uh, uh, hashing them and, and in the key by and so on. So it's a lot of traffic uh, as well. So yeah, here we can see it was when we have uh, 80 workers, uh, uh, 30 work, uh, 40 workers, 30 workers, and then it's, it goes down. Uh, so, um, conclusion, um, what is uh, really nice here, in fact, is we managed to take the original algorithm without modifying that much, apart from it from Java, and it really works fast. Uh, so then the big advantage is you don't have, because at first I was thinking maybe I will have to try to do the parallelization in Flink itself, so it will be like, you know, trying to see how I can parallelize the work and so on. Uh, I mean, that would be maybe uh, a bit more more fun, but uh, it's, when you can use something out of the box without doing something too complicated, at least it's very easy to, to use out of the box and you can take directly advantage of it in, in Flink. Uh, you can use it on massive, massive pass data very efficiently as we saw, like we're just taking less than one minute on one thread to, to, to run on these uh, frequency data points. And uh, yeah, the, on streaming data, uh, you might need some tweaking if you have very small windows, uh, but then you can refer to the uh, paper I mentioned at the beginning to see how they, they did it, uh, and so on to even have better performance, uh, and so on. So, yeah, see. Uh, yeah, future works. Um, yeah, it's beginning of a list, but you have yeah, plenty of idea. Uh, you can also maybe if you are in a dynamic environment, like I don't know, like what uh, uh, Criteo was saying, for example, or like fraud is changing all the time. Uh, so you might want to update your pattern, so you could have a stream of patterns and then update your your pattern. So it's very easy to to use to do with Flink. Uh, yeah, and also you can use Flink for the, all the pre-processing, like what I said. You know, you can remove values. Uh, outliers and so on, uh, maybe do even some CEP with Flink even before considering the data. Uh, more tests on Kubernetes and uh, yeah, I will, this one I will, given the remaining time I will not go, go into detail, but maybe an optimization to use a fault function instead of the process one uh, from the streaming a API. Uh, but yeah, so uh, thank you all for your, your attention and yeah, I will be if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Christoph, for the talk. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. I wanted to know how do you define the pattern, uh, what it looks like? Um, in fact, it's, it's, uh, it comes from the like, business perspective. Uh, like for the frequency, they say, okay, regulation told us if we have um, flat frequency, drop of 50 millihertz, and then flat again, that's what we are looking for. Uh, the same for uh, cardiogram, you doctors know uh, what kind of, what, what they are looking for. And as you are using diameter wrapping, then it's pretty okay to be not very precise, because in fact it will manage to adapt a bit to, even if it's not fully precise, you find, find it. so. Maybe even the doctor later can have, um, he asks for 100 matches, look how it looks and say, okay, this, maybe this one is a bit better than the one I, I, I enter. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a business requirement to, to have the pattern. Uh, is it like a matrix? Is it a, a time series? Uh, it's is a time series, it? the okay. same. Just, okay. yeah. A list of double and it goes. Any other questions? Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, how does this? How well does this work in matching time, time series of different magnitudes or different time lengths? Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so what uh, what they do in fact here there is some normalization step. 
so that you know if it's different magnitude, then it will all be normalized. Mm -hmm. uh, that, in fact, that's what the, most of the computation is normalization. Right. Uh, and then you, if you have different frequencies and so on, you will have to pre-process to align uh, the pattern to the to it. But okay. the same, it's usually it's, it should be okay. Cool. Thanks. Any more takers? So you also mentioned that uh, you can apply it on many, many time series. So when your algorithm is just the total number of points, the only uh, scale that is important, or the number of time series itself is also important. Yeah, yeah. That's that's why when I say that why probably uh, if you have shorter time series, uh, then it's because as I said, the performance depends on the length of the time series. So you might have more time series. Uh, with um, uh, with a lot, lot of different sensors, and that might need to optimize because performance will will be less great than a long time series. But if you, yeah, I mean, there is really it's not it should be not too complicated to to keep the optimization when you look what you are looking for. You can lot of compu every computation are, could be done just one, shared in in Flink directly, and when you have the open function like a rich map function, you can just load. Uh, what you already calculated just once and share it between uh, everything, and then it will be much, much faster because you can initialize uh, because you know more or less what you are looking for. So that will be the, the way, but yeah. Uh, okay, I'm afraid we uh, don't have time for more questions, but if you still want to chat about this with Christoph, just catch him outside. Um, we will now have a break for coffee break. We'll be back at 3.30. Thank you so much, Christoph, for your talk. Yeah, thank you.